Now, we are about to give you access to a focus group with a twist, a big one, and we're calling it the criminal opportunity. Taking part is an ex-fraudster, an ex-copper, a former hacker, and a native of Blackpool, England, that's been dubbed the Mafia Princess. So before we open up the doors on that, in brief, let's deal with the latter. I'm sure you're curious. Mar Marissa Mariko's story is remarkable. And frankly, it reads like the plot of a far-fetched film. But as we know, in fact, often outguns fiction, and this is no exception. Marissa was born in Italy to an English mother and a father, known as one of the most feared mafia godfathers in modern history, Emilio Di Giovane. The family name, Di Giovane, is, by the way, Italian mafia royalty. Now, further background, as a child, Marissa was taken here to England by her mother, but later returned to Italy, where she served alongside, and indeed in place of her father, at the helm of his criminal empire. Marissa joins me now. You're very, very welcome. Nice to have you. As I say, absolutely fascinating story. To begin with, and to better understand your extremely unique background, I'm going to start with some yes or no quickfire questions. Are you ready? Hi. Yes. Hi. Good. Great to have you. Now, you. yes or no, Marissa, you returned to Italy in your 20s, fell in love with a married mafia enforcer, and your father, Emilio Di Giovane, that was his right-hand man. Is that accurate? Yes, that's right, yeah. Yes or no? Is it true that whilst your father was serving time in prison for his involvement in organised crime, you, at the age of 22, controlled the criminal empire for a period? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Is it true that drugs, arms and money, Marissa, excuse me, money laundering, was at the heart of that criminal operation? Was that generally what the business relied upon? Yes or no? Yes. Is it true that whilst you were calling the shots of that mafia empire, millions and millions of euros, all the proceeds of crime, of course, were generated by the family's many illicit business interests? Were you dealing in millions? It was big bucks, not small. Yeah, most definitely. <laughs> mm. Yes or no? Is yeah. it true that... <laughs> That's okay. Is it true? The next question. Is it true that a relative, your auntie turned informer, and based on the information she leaked to the authorities, you were locked up for four years in total, a year and a half in an Italian maximum security prison, then two and a half years in H-Wing Durham, notorious, an English high security prison where Myra Hindley and Rose West were also in prison, as I said earlier on. This is the stuff of fiction more so than fact in normal circumstances. Is that true? Yes, unfortunately, yes. We'll get to mm -hmm. that in more detail mm -hmm. later. Um, just very finally for the quick fire questions, yes mm -hmm. or no? And I, I ask this at the very beginning because, Marissa, this is what people will be wondering. When they hear the term Mafia Princess, when they hear your backstory, when they hear what you've been through, this will be the first question that comes to mind. So let's get it out of the way. During your time in charge of the family's criminal operation, did you hand down or approve the order to have anyone murdered? No. Thankfully, no. So that was something you didn't find yourself in a situation having no. to do? Thankfully, no, I wasn't put in that position. Mm. Your father then? Emilio Di Giovane is known across Italy, as I said, as one of the most feared mafia godfathers in modern history. So briefly, just tell us about your dad. Tell us about your father and how did his family and then subsequently yours, of course, come to be a mafia family? How does that happen? And tell us about your father. Well, he was actually born into it. So it comes from uh, generations of being in the mafia of families being in that. So it goes back a few hundred years. Um, so he was born into that. But of course, that was in Southern Italy, which is Calabria, which is part of the Andrangheta. That's what we were part of. And he was born into it. So he wasn't just affiliated in time or he was literally, it was in the blood. So uh, eventually in the late 60s, uh, my grandmother went up to Milan with my grandfather. That's where everything started up in the north of Milan. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's the involvement basically because of uh, sure. born into it. 
Mm. Of course. In terms then, just in terms of your father, because, you know, we, we we hear that title, don't we? One of the most feared mafia godfathers in modern history. And we see and think of only one thing, ruthlessness, a dark streak, cruelty. I'm sure your father was more complex than that, though. Tell me a little bit about him very briefly and the type of character traits he would have that we might not have guessed. To be fair, he's just a very charismatic man, very much a businessman. Unfortunately, he put his, uh, if you will, his intelligence in that sort of way into crime because that's all he ever knew. And someone else said about him, you know, if you'd have put all that, what he knew and his knowledge and everything into politics, <laughs> he'd have been a great politician. You know, it was, it's because... I've, I'm not saying that as an excuse, he was born into that. But he was very charismatic, very much a businessman, didn't do much of schooling, but he's still still very clever in what he did and what he was yeah. capable of as well. Were you ever scared of your father? Uh, I very much had a lot of respect for him. Um, yeah, there was sometimes a little bit of apprehension in his presence, you know, when he be a bit angry about it's not towards me but in other mm. things he was very much you know uh, to be feared and also by me um in some ways of course so during your time at the helm of the operation again just to give a tiny bit of background there you know at a very tender age of 22 mm. your father was placed in prison and then he saw something in you marissa that paved the way for him to put you at the top of that pyramid basically pulling the strings in a mafia operation so when you were at the helm did you see murder death and violence which are all elements components of the mafia lifestyle differently than you do now and if so how is your current mindset different what brought about that change well thankfully while i was at the helm nothing like that happened you know there was no wars going on there was no gangs rivalry there was no thankfully so uh i mean i had the main rivals probably my uncle that was trying to take over because <laughs> that's what happened you know within the family the tribe because they see me as a young girl and, and oh she can't do that uh, yeah. of course i've looked at over the last in over the years i've looked and thought you know why was i put there why uh obviously i show uh, i've I must have shown that I was capable of it. But I, even though I was a young age, and a lot was to do with my father always wanted a, a son, a son, and he had a girl. And I was really made to feel that in my youth, that he wanted a son. So I, within okay. myself, looking back on it, I feel that I was showing him that actually a girl could do just as much. Um, so obviously that's a little bit of daddy issues there but i'm looking back at now as an adult you know uh obviously i'm 50 now so i i can you know that's a tender age and i can look back and with my criminology i've realized a lot of things looking at both sides of things but um of course so i'm hoping that answers your question with that no it does it does and, and it plays into the next one to be honest so i'm wondering as i'm sure everybody else is because you will have been in a position where you will have been called upon to do things that will affect people very negatively, very badly, and in some circumstances, permanently, Marissa. So do you feel guilt at all over the things you did whilst being at the helm of the Dijovene Mafia operation? And, you know, if so, what specifically, what incident, if there is one, caused you the most guilt? What still plays on your conscience? I feel, um, obviously, the I, I do feel, you know, I've sinned and I am, I feel guilty. I carry it till now, but there's one specific thing that I do carry till now, a situation where I overheard a conversation of someone that was going to get killed literally mm. the next day. And um, it was a situation where my family didn't really have much choice, only because the person that was going to be killed lived in my family's territory, but he'd overstepped the line with the Gomorrah. So ahead of the Explain Gamora, what Gamora is. A Gamora is the so you have the Andrangheta is the um, uh, Calabrian mafia, 
you've got Sicilian mafia, which is the uh, mafia Cosa Nostra, and then you've got the Gamorra, which is the Naples mafia, Napolitan mm. mafia. So, which I think quite, quite a lot of people might have heard of that due to the uh, series Gamora, but um, that he was a really high up guy and he actually did it himself. He actually killed the guy himself. And, and it had um, my father or my grandmother refuse that, it would have created probably a war between my family and, and them. So it, it, that's how it works. You know, it's you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Sometimes there's certain things you can't. Anyway, th- to, to get to the point, I overheard mm. this conversation. I was probably about 19, 20. And I had to, and I knew who it was and I knew the family. And he was a married man with, you know, family with two children. And that was quite hard hard for yeah. me but at the time you know what was I meant to do I was going to go to the police they would arrest my family and myself yeah. possibly or would I uh, tell the person and then they might have come for me you know it's mm. one of them you, you just and, and of course it's, it sounds really a surreal situation but unfortunately for me that was a reality and I've had to carry if on. you could go back another yes or no question for you oh. <laughs> would you would you change the decision that you made? Would you let that person know? I know it's difficult, but yes or no? In all honesty, no, I wouldn't. Because okay. had it not been him, he would have been possibly my father or a member of my so family. literally the decision. I yeah. Do. I understand, yeah. The decisions you were making were literally, were literally life and death. So, uh, you know, yeah. that comes down to, I suppose, a question of, of moral compass we're getting some questions in here that i'll put to you later on yeah um as well but you know fascinating stuff um in terms of prison you did um get locked up for the crimes that you were involved in for what the family did you spent time in in italian prison you spent time in an english prison that's a very famous one the h-wing in durham marissa um sum up that experience briefly for us if such a thing can be done and overall you know, did it change you as a person being locked up behind bars with Myra Hindley and Rose West? Um, I mean, you know, prison is a, an horrific experience uh, in itself. Um, I mean, the H wing was probably even more because it was somewhere where long term life as Britain's most notorious women were in there. I was held as a double category A prisoner, which is like a terrorist now, I guess because of the mafia uh, label I had, which quite rightly so, but at that time, but I knew I was still mean in a surreal kind of way. And it took me about two weeks to realize actually where I was, but uh, as as of how it's made me. So being in there, being in them places, you know, they call it the university of crime, which it is, you know, I picked up on, Silly things like they say, oh, at the time, you know, oh, yeah, you can go in and steal clothes by a, uh, you put foil around the bag and the, the beep thing wouldn't go off. And it was things that I did. I know it's silly things, but I was like, did I really need to know that? <laughs> you know, it's, and it's silly things like that that you pick up on. And of course, if you wanted to, harsher things. But I sort of out of that experience, I've tried to come out of it a better person. And it could have easily made me bitter and twisted. But uh, it hasn't. And as I said, you know, I'm doing my criminology now and I'm trying, you know, reform certain policies to do with prison. I'm trying to sort of get into that sort of, uh, to try and do something good out of bad uh, without allowing it to, uh, you know, make me, as I said, bitter and twisted. Just do good with it rather than, yeah. and than bad. Which of course it could do. Just very briefly, because we do want to get to this this focus group, which you're taking part in. We'll also have an opportunity to ask and put more questions to you yeah. um, a bit later on. So if you do have questions, mm-hmm. pop them into the session chat for us. Just very briefly, your father, is he still at the helm of the De Jovene Mafia operation? Is he still active? And you yourself, 
I mean, obviously enough by speaking to me, by speaking publicly. There's a book, of course, that you've written about your experience. You are essentially breaking a code of silence. So why aren't you being hunted down and killed? And what role is your father now playing in that operation? So my father now is, is getting on a bit now. <laughs> he's, he's quite, you know, uh, an oldish guy. So he's actually retired from all that. He's left that behind and he's changed his life. He's realised possibly you know they say never too late thankfully he did a long time inside and he realized that you know that wasn't the way forward for him and he mm. leads a very humble life now um as a pensioner so thankfully my relationship with him is probably the best i've ever had now uh which is good um and as far as the book which is i've got one here <laughs> there we go um, Love your princess, indeed. <laughs> um as far as the book um uh with my book so the people a few people have asked me that the, the thing is i've wrote about myself and anything that's in there regarding anybody else is in the public domain you go on the internet and you can find it, it was all at trial my family's trial in italy so I haven't, possibly I've said more things about myself that, that it wasn't in the domain, but you know, it's, I haven't spoke about anybody else that I shouldn't have. And mm. to be honest, I think they've got better things to do than to come to someone like myself from 30 nearly years ago, 27 yeah. is it, that's involved in all that. Because of course I've been away from all that for a long, long time now. Yeah, of course, but still skirting a fine line. Let's mm -hmm. dig down into that a bit later in a bit more detail, because as I said, I do want to get to that focus group we promised, which has an ex-fraudster, an ex-hacker, a copper, and of course you, as your book says, and is titled The Mafia Princess. So this focus group, for those of you still watching, is called The Criminal Opportunity. Andy MacDonald and Marissa, I'm glad to say, are going to kick things off. So Andy, over to you, Marissa. I'll speak to you in a while. So, Marissa, I talked a lot about my perception during our opening presentation. I'd estimate, in terms of criminals, that I dealt with about 90% of men versus 10% of women during my 30 years. It may well just be a traditional or generational thing, but, far, but I know that far higher percentages of women are involved in criminality, from low-level crime right up to those at the top of the organised crime groups. We saw the vital roles played by women during the foreign terrorist fighters travelling to the IS Caliphate and those conflict zones. Some were brainwashed wives doing Allah's will, but many others might well have been brainwashed, but they were simply criminals and terrorists, and they continue to pose a really significant threat. It's not just in those radical Islamist arenas, as we've also seen straightforwardly criminal roles taken in far-right extremist arenas, from fundraising, through spouting that vile propaganda and ideology, I'm thinking about the Miss Hitler competitions and things like that, to retail and IT support, and to plotting some of the most violent acts that you can think. It goes back to my concern that we really don't or know or understand much about some criminals or the threats, and that perhaps we need to involve those who actually do in the process. So I'm interested in what Marissa thinks and how we might be able to get valuable insights into how women either become criminals or become involved with criminal or terrorist networks. Andy, um, as you said there, you know, you, you, you investigated far more uh, of, of male crime than a female, 10%, I think you said there. Um, that's probably because, um, obviously in the past, females probably, probably had sort of a, a lesser role. This time has gone on. Um, I'm talking about the 90s, that's when I was sort of heavily involved in organised crime. Um, uh, the women that were very much involved and we were probably the backbone of the organisation. Uh, you know, the lo logistical side, the uh, anything to do with that, uh, rather than being hands-on, which were the guys really that were, you know, the hands-on, we were the logistical side of, of everything, the organised side of of that. I mean, you know, uh, there was a review last year that said that um, women in Italy, in mafia, mafia 
uh, related uh, crimes. The women in Italy own a third of assets, of mafia assets. Um, so, you know, in the leisure industry, industry and, and all sorts. So, you know, that potentially says quite a lot uh, of the involvement of women. Um, when the police used to come, very rarely, but they did, to do uh, a search, a house search, um, they never looked at the women. Um, so it, it's like an old-fashioned way of, of, of thinking, well, the women can't be involved. You know, we're the nurturers, we're the... So basically, when they used to come and do the house searches, we, you know, we'd be sat there, I'd be sat there on top of a, um, a loose tile where there's a compartment with a gun in it, and sat there uh, with money around, you know, my body that I've been able to sort of put a pad all the way around me. And so it's 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 that, you know, and they just they used to look at us and not even give us a second glance because the, the majority would be male officers. Of course, they didn't strip search us and we weren't touch the women. It's like an old fashioned thing. Now I'm talking about Italy and you're talking about obviously an era where also, there was a lot shown, shown a lot more respect. I guess it was a strange thing where the police wouldn't ultimately cross the line in uh, daring to search the women because of possibly even the repercussions of what would happen if they touched the women of organised crime. I feel that the police saw very few women because uh, the perception was that the women were nurturers and they couldn't, you know, they couldn't possibly be involved in, in the wider picture of the organisation. They thought that the women were under duress and uh, they were made to uh, be there, basically, uh, against their own will. But actually, it wasn't like that at all. Um, you know, what was perceived by the authorities was totally different to the actual reality that the women were there at their own will. So I'm often asked if a criminal, like a leopard, can change their spots. Well, I'm sitting here today with three people who've done just that. They know, having done what I did for 30 years, I'm not at all convinced that many can or do actually change their spots. We've seen the recent cessations of violence in our gang communities or in the county line environments. We've also read that some mafia families in Italy have been hailed for various bene benevolent acts, such as distributing food, and cancelling certain debts during the current COVID crisis. It all reminds me a bit of Pablo Escobar and how some of his exploits were portrayed in Narcos and similar. My knee-jerk reaction as a member of the public might be, this is great news and far less risks to innocent individuals and communities. I suppose the slightly more cynical old policeman in me probably thinks that there isn't much of an altruistic nature in most of these types. It's more likely that the market's a bit flat at the moment and perhaps they see an opportunity to network a bit further into the mainstream community, who will then, at a later point, be reminded of what's owed to them. Well, uh, you'd like to think that at these times that uh, there would be, it would be great for them to be doing a good deed. You know, a lot of mafia, uh, the mafia is uh, very religious, very involved in, with, with uh, the Catholic Church, very religious and you'd like them to think that they, they were Samaritan but unfortunately that's not the case because if they do infiltrate somehow into someone's business especially now someone who's desperate uh, things are happening very different in Italy with this COVID-19 and you know they're not getting as much help as, as the UK with small businesses so they'd be very tempted to uh, lend money from the mafia um, but there will be strings attached. They will not be doing that uh, just for a goodwill. They will be doing that, that because eventually they will probably have a, a big share of the business, if not all, or literally take it over. Uh, so, you know, and, and it's just that it is like, the mafia is like a virus. Uh, it infiltrate. infiltrate. <laughs> And at times like this, a crisis like this, it, this is where they get the most opportunities because of uh, people's vulnerability. Back to my police perception. And I mentioned this in an earlier presentation. We know that locally in the London borough of Etonian I live, 
there are scammers visiting with flyers about the Get My Grant scam and for government funds. We've also seen doorsteppers offering food deliveries and even selling fake COVID testing kits. And then, of course, we have the daily online bombardment of inboxes I spoke about in the presentation, or text and messaging platforms with similar scans. Of course, we're not going to fall for any of them, are we? Hmm. So who's doing it? Is it just the usual scammers, just seeing another opportunity? Or is it that we have a new breed of criminal that we know very little about, unfortunately? I'm not sure the intelligence picture is at all clear at the moment from a law enforcement perspective. Really interested to know what Solomon, Tony and Marissa think. I don't feel that these are a new breed of criminals. I feel that um, it's, the, you, you know, criminals are already there, but the focus now is more on that because they can't go out there to do scans personally. So ultimately, they're focusing more on the online um, scamming, you know, the fake bank accounts, the fake, uh, I mean, Interpol uh, said, that they, I think there was 2,000 sites um, made with this, with this COVID-19 that uh, people were purchasing from and they were fake. So, um, you know, that's just now, that's just within that time. So, um, you know, there was the other example is of the uh, school lunches. Uh, as soon as the school closed, the emails were sent to pay into accounts um, which they thought were council or the actual school for the school dinners and and that was a fake you know many parents did that so it, it's um they're obviously uh focusing on the misery of people which is uh unfortunately that's uh some of the human natures that we have out there